All right, students, uh, that might have seen a little melodramatic, but I don't think it is. Um, I said from the very beginning of the pandemic that we were all going to be saved by a bunch of science nerds, uh, geeks who spent their entire lives hunched over um, microscopes and, uh, and data sheets and uh, test tubes, people who devoted themselves to science. And the reason I'm introducing um, our unit on induction using uh, these uh, lab uh, uh, researchers is because that's the difference between inductive logic and deductive logic. Deductive logic is math. That is, if you set it up right, the conclusion has to follow. It cannot be otherwise. Uh, if you come out with a conclusion that's not true, then you had a problem with your premises if you set up the argument correctly. Induction is a very different matter. Induction is saying that if we have a really good inductive argument, the outcome is most likely, is probable. Um, it's uh, narrowing down the field when we say, well, anything's possible. Sure, anything's possible in an infinite universe. Anything is possible. But what induction wants to do is say, can we narrow that field and be able to say, what is probable? What is most likely? And construct solid logical arguments that will get us there. So we're going to go back to our argument flow chart, way back to the beginning of the semester. Remember, uh, we want to, first of all, make sure we understand what a statement is. A combination of statements is can be formulated into an argument. That is, uh, premises that the person is arguing lead to a conclusion. And there are two sides of those arguments. Deductive, we've just spent a lot of time on, and now we're coming over here to induction. So an inductive argument is an argument in which you are saying probably the result of my argument will be cogent. And that's the language we use. So an inductive argument is strong or it is weak. If it is weak, then it is automatically uncogent. Uncogent basically means it just doesn't make any sense. You can't trust it. On the other hand, if it is a strong argument and the premises are true, then we have a cogent argument. So a cogent argument needs a strong argument with true premises. Remember, in deduction, we wanted a, a sound argument with true premises, right? So if the argument was valid, true premises led us to a sound argument. In induction, we want a strong argument with true premises, and that leads us to an argument that we say is cogent. Is it absolute? Is it guaranteed? No, but it's probable. And the strength of the argument lies in the credibility, the reliability of the premises, and then the connection, the part that you say entails the conclusion and how strong that link is. We're going to look at several kinds of inductive arguments. So there are uh, a lot of inductive uh, arguments and reasons, um, but I'm just going to look at a couple of here. Uh, inductive generalization, predictive arguments, arguments from authority, signs, causal arguments, statistical arguments, and arguments from analogy. And you'll see that they overlap each other. But I want you to be able to recognize these in the wild so that if you... Uh, listen to somebody and they make an argument and you say, hmm, they seem to be making a predictive argument, therefore it has to be inductive, and that means that the result is not absolutely guaranteed. Even if they say it is, it's not. And then we want to then evaluate the strength of the sources and the, uh, the reliability of those um, premises. So the first thing we're going to be looking at here is um, inductive generalizations. Okay, and this is what, when you say inductive logic, oftentimes this is what people mean. In an inductive uh, generalization, you're basically saying that there is a, 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 a category that I want to say something about. And then I say, well, I know this is true of some of the group, and therefore, I'm going to extrapolate that that is true of most or all of that category. 
So if I told you every squirrel I have ever seen has a tail, probably all normal squirrels have tails. Now, notice that there's a giveaway that this is an inductive argument, and that's the word probably. Okay, So probably is automatically telling you that it's not absolutely certain, but I'm going to say it's probable. Why? Because every squirrel I've ever seen has a tail. Okay. Now, the strength of this argument is the question of how many squirrels have you observed? How old are you? And where do you live? Right. I happen to live in a, a neighborhood with lots of woods. I've seen tons and tons of squirrels. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm in my 50s. So I've been around the block a, a while and I've seen lots of squirrels. Every single one of them have a tail. So I feel pretty confident saying that probably all normal squirrels have tails. Notice I even in, in use the word normal. So I recognize that, hey, there may be some uh, squirrels that are born with some sort of defect. There may be squirrels that have been victim of some sort of attack, um, and they might be minus a tail. But normal squirrels have tails. Um, again, if I was talking to a biologist, if I was talking to a forest ranger, uh, that argument even goes up stronger because here's somebody who specializes in that sort of observation. And so um, if I make the claim that probably all squirrels have tails, it will be, rely on my experience with that group. So we could sort of break it down in more formal terms and say, okay, so an X percent of the observed members of group A have a certain property. We're going to call that P. Therefore, um, then I'm going to extrapolate that a certain percent of all the members of that same group have that same property. So I've looked at a X number of uh, swans and uh, uh, let's say 90% of the swans I've ever seen are white. Therefore, I'm going to extrapolate that 90% of all swans are white because that's the, the observations I've made. And of course, we're going to want to be able to evaluate that. How can we decide if that's right? So first of all, we wanted to make sure we understand what is the target group? That is the whole group that you're trying to make an assertion about, whether it's all college students or are you trying to make an assertion about um, college students that come from divorced homes or whatever. We want to know what's the target group. And then what is your sample size, right? What is the number of observations you've made? Because that's going to decide whether this is a strong argument or not. If you have a very small observation of this very small group, and then you want to try to extrapolate that to the entire group, that makes a very weak argument. And then the question is, what is the relevant property? I uh, want to make sure that whatever that characteristic is that you want to talk about is something that we can actually see as significant in that group. So those are the things we want to evaluate when we're trying to decide if a um, generalization is valid. Remember, we talked about hasty generalization as a logical fallacy, right? I know one or two, and so if I jump to a conclusion about the whole group from just a few observations, right, that's, that's bias, that's prejudice, um, that's a hasty generalization. Okay, so here's one for you, right? Uh, Alvin is a graduate of JCTC, and he's bright, energetic, and dependable. Aaron is a graduate of JCTC, and he is bright and energetic and dependable. So Evangeline is also a graduate of JCTC. Therefore, I'm going to guess that she probably is bright, energetic, and dependable. Um, again, you can see this uh, fails because I'm trying to... Um, a tribute to all JCTC students, um, an observation I've made in two of them. Now, I have found them to be bright, energetic, and dependable. Um, and again, that's because as a professor and I've been teaching uh, at Jefferson Community College for um, now going on six years, and I've taught hundreds and hundreds of students, and I've taught multiple classes. And so I can now say, because of my general observation, I might be able to make some observations about college students that we could extrapolate to say, now, remember, I teach philosophy. So there is a large 
percentage of students that never take a humanities course or very rarely take humanities courses because they're going into technical fields. And so maybe uh, that e I might even skew my answer because uh, you might say, well, but you haven't seen this kind of student, so you can't necessarily make a generalization. But certainly, after meeting two students, you cannot extrapolate to that third student just because you've seen two other ones. Okay, and so this is um, just basically, this is a give me, this is a freebie. Um, anytime somebody predicts the future, they are making an inductive argument because you cannot make a deductive argument about the future because you don't know what it will be like. Uh, there's no way to prove and make any sort of absolute statement about the future. I mean, the world could end. Then you would be out of luck. So uh, what we have, anytime you make an inductive argument where you predict the future, and we're going to see that this is true with statistics, when you try to predict the future, you are moving into the world of inductive arguments. And I should add that um, there are a fair number of philosophers throughout time that have said that um, that's an actually a, a, a fallacy, that our assumption that the future will be like the past is really based on an you know, unprovable uh, assumption. David Hume, most uh, famously as a skeptic, said that we basically accept the future uh, as a, basically is just sort of a habit because it's always sort of worked out that way. But we really can't for certain say that that is absolutely uh, the case. Um, but we just sort of move on that way as if that is a valid argument. Okay, so here's one. Um, most U.S. presidents have been tall. They're pro probably the next U.S. president will be tall. Um, this is a predictive argument. It's based on the observation of, um, what are we on, uh, 45, 46. Um, you know, we've had, um, you know, not even 50 presidents in the history of our country, um, and most of them have been tall. Um, and so the the idea that the certainty that the next one will probably be tall is um, pretty weak. This is, a, this is a weak argument. This would really fail. Um, there's also what we call sort of weasel words in here. Uh, first of all, it says most U.S. presidents have been tall. Now, what does most mean, right? So that's not a defined. And also tall. What do you mean by tall? Uh, is tall mean over six feet? Does tall mean uh, five foot eight? I mean, what what's the definition of tall? So you have two, two slippery words in here that aren't clear. Remember, going all the way back to logical arguments have, to have TLC. That to be true. They have to be logical. They have to be clear. And so that fails the clear test. So we can't make a strong argument for a future president being tall because the, the argument itself is weak and poorly constructed. Okay, so here's another example, though. How about this one? Uh, it has rained in Toronto every February since weather records have been kept. Therefore, it will probably rain in Toronto next February. Okay, now you hear the language. First of all, it's clearly predicting the future, and it uses the word probably. Um, but this is a pretty strong argument. You know, in other words, this is just not somebody saying, well, you know, I was in Toronto and it rained a lot. Uh, this is saying that since, as long as they've been keeping weather records, it has rained in Toronto in February. So this is a very strong argument that that probably going to rain in February next year. Now, you could even ask yourself, where do these this data coming from, right? I mean, uh, is this being kept by t television stations? Is this being kept by the National Weather Service? Uh, that would even add more strength to the argument. But if, if this is true, that it has rained every year in February, then eh, it's a pretty good bet that it's going to rain this February. That's a strong inductive argument. All right, the next inductive argument is an argument from authority. I mean, let's face it. We all have to make decisions about things in which we are personally not experts. Um, in fact, that's uh, sometimes the definition of being irrational, right? When you disagree with experts, when you're not, when you're not one. 
Um, so whether it's you know, buying a car, buying a house, uh, making medical decisions, uh, global warming, I mean, there's a whole host of things that I am not an expert on. So I have to rely on authorities to help make the arguments for me that I should recycle or I should not buy a uh, electric car or I should buy an electric car. What do the authorities say? What are the arguments that I can appeal to to know if something is right or wrong? And of course, um, this is the old uh, schoolyard argument, right? When you're with your friends hanging around and somebody say, Something in this. Oh, yeah. Who says so? Right. So uh, if I made the statement, uh, more Americans die of skin cancer each year than die in car accidents. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. And so you say, well, how do you know that? What is your source on that? And I say, well, I had a conversation with my doctor about uh, wanting me to make sure that I wore um, uh, sunscreen because he pointed out that more Americans die from skin cancer than car accidents. So the authority on this, my doctor, who has a do degree in medicine, uh, who has my best interest in hearts and, uh, you know, is basically telling me information that is credible. He's a good, credible source for this data. And so uh, it not only is a strong argument because I have an authority who's trusted who's giving me the information and then again i could test the cogency of this right so in order to be cogent the premises have to be true so i think it wouldn't be too difficult to actually prove this i could do search on on the internet and i could find the number of deaths annually by skin cancer the number of deaths annually by car accident and i could compare and find out if it is a cogent argument this brings me to one of my personal favorite types of inductive arguments, and that is signs. Um, I work in an area of philosophy that is known as semiotics, and we give a lot of attention to uh, the use of symbols and signs in communication and how we create reality uh, from uh, communications. And we distinguish between signs and symbols and um, emblems and uh, all that sort of stuff. It's more technical than that, but uh, I love signs because you never really thought about it, but they are actually inductive arguments. That is, when you see, uh, a, a, let's say the simplest thing, is you see a road sign, you assume because of past experience that road signs are reliable, right? You're driving along and there's a thing that says, you know, this way to St. Louis, uh, you don't necessarily get out. Well, you probably don't even think about it. You just follow your GPS. But uh, you see a sign. Even your GPS, though, is using data that it's assuming is reliable. So you see uh, a highway sign that says 64 West uh, to St. Louis, and you just take it. You assume that that's going to be right. Now, is it always right? No, of course not. We all know there have been situations where signs have been uh, misinterpreted or misplaced or whatever. But we live our lives following directions derived from signage, symbols, and we assume that they are correct because of past experience, right? So if you're uh, walking along the campus and you see a sign that says um, student government uh, meeting free pizza, um, you might go follow that sign because, you know, in the past when you've seen student government activities and they've involved free food there's been free food on the other side hand if you see uh, if you're walking down the, an alley and you see a sketchy sign scribbled out on cardboard that says free food this way and it points down a dark alley and you can't see what's back there you might not follow that sign because you're not sure the the sign is credible you don't have any experience with that kind of sign being trustworthy and so signs are actually sort of inductive arguments uh, if you go to an art museum and you see underneath a painting there's a, a plaque and it tells you who the artist is and details about it you sort of assume that that's right it's an inductive argument now because it could be wrong right it, it could be somebody put it in the wrong place maybe they've changed out the exhibit and nobody has yet changed the signage um, but we've learned that signs are reliable 
And, of course, there's the uh, always famous and popular one-way signs, right? So, uh, generally speaking, when you see a, a one-way sign in a, in a, in a city, uh, you trust that that's the correct direction to go. Um, does that mean that everybody is going to be going the correct direction? Absolutely not. And surely you've somewhere in your life had the experience of being on a one-way street, going the right way, only to find somebody is going the wrong direction. So the fact that there's a sign indicating that this is a one-way street does not mean that everybody is going to be going that one direction. Uh, I remember uh, being told one time that that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Uh, knowledge is knowing that it's a one-way street when you get ready to cross it. And wisdom is looking both ways anyway. So that sign doesn't necessarily correspond to reality, but we have generally come to understand signs as reliable inductive arguments. And this is just too delicious for me not to pass along. Uh, this sign is actually uh, just about a quarter mile from my house, um, and uh, it's absolutely wrong. Um, they were building this subdivision uh, about a, over the last like year and a half, and in fact, this road did end at the construction. And so they put up this sign to say there's no outlet so that people wouldn't keep trying to go through there because you can't. Uh, get through. But since then, they finished the construction and they actually have finished the road. So the road is actually complete and you can drive through it and it's perfectly good and it'll get you where you want to go. Uh, so one of the things we say in semiotics for something to actually be a sign, it also has to be able to lie. You have to be able to tell a lie with the sign. So this sign is lying to us. Now, what's interesting, again, if you think about it from a philosophical point of view, if you don't know that that road is a through road, you'd have to drive it to find out that it goes through. If you see this sign, you're like, oh, crap. And then you turn around and go back the way you came and find another way. You've actually assumed a false reality. So you and you may even tell other people, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. You know, that stupid road isn't finished and I had to take the long way around. Um, and they may act on that, too. Uh, so that what you have is a belief and not knowledge. And that's another whole thing in philosophy of what is considered truth and knowledge. And that is justified true belief. You can believe anything you want about this road, but it is complete and through, even though the sign uh, says otherwise. And then there are uh, signs that are just plain weird, uh, where somebody uh, wasn't really thinking um, and uh, there's all kinds of these uh, kind of bloopers. But um, so remember, one of the things we look for in logic and particularly about inductive logic is for an argument to be strong. We really need to make sure that the terms are precise and not full of weasel words so that there's no way to sort of nail down what it is exactly you're trying to say, because the strength of the argument is going to lie on the truth of those premises and the reliability of the argument. This is probably the most difficult uh, inductive argument to sort of nail down um, because it is so slippery and some people make it so subjective that it almost becomes pointless. But a causal argument is when you basically say that this causes that. And so uh, you're making a connection between that whatever this event is, it is caused by something else. An earthquake is caused by slippage of tectonic plates. Um, that the when this plates slip, that causes our sensation of an earthquake. One causes the other. But we have to be careful. There in uh, logic, uh, we talk about uh, that correlation is not causation. Correlation means that there are two things that often come together. They often are associated with each other. When one comes, happens, you see the other one, and it's very easy to begin to assume that one caused the other. Um, this is very famous. There's all this stuff about uh, people that are against vaccines, and there's this myth 
there's this lie that's been perpetrated that vaccines cause autism. And that is a error of causation versus um, correlation. The correlation is that about the time that children receive a set of um, immunizations is also about the same time that signs of autism begin to show up in their behavior. The, the two are not causal. The two are correlated. That it has to do with the age of the child. The age of the child at a certain age is when certain autistic uh, behaviors are observable and it is also the same age that um, children receive certain uh, immunizations. They are not caused one by the other. They are simply correlated because they happen about the same time. Uh, there's also a very famous argument that says, you know, that, uh, you know, nine, uh, you know, almost everybody we know dies in bed. Therefore, uh, you shouldn't sleep in a bed because they cause death. Um, now, that's ridiculous. We know that De beds are not causing people to die. When people are sick and not feeling well, they tend to lay down and we tend to care for them in a laying position so we can care for them. It is not the bed that is causing the death. It is the fact that people are in the act, act of dying and we tend to put them in a lying down position. So it, it is correlated but not causal. Uh, this argument sometimes is also called the Chanticleer fallacy. Chanticleer is the French word for rooster. And so, you know, the idea is the farmer goes out and he says, you know, every morning my rooster crows and the sun comes up. Rooster crows, the sun comes up. The rooster must be causing the sun to come up. But that's exactly wrong. They are correlated because they come at, together but they are not causal. The rooster crowing has nothing to do with whether or not the sun comes up or not. So there's all kinds of um, examples of this. Uh, and I found this one I thought was kind of funny, which was basically correlating uh, uh, global warming and uh, the demise of pirates. Uh, and so this chart shows almost exact um, correlation between the number of pirates since uh, you know the uh, 1820 and sea temperature rise so the sea temperature since uh, 1820 has risen about a deg uh, degree and a half uh, almost two degrees Celsius and over that time the correlation of the pirates diminishing has followed that almost exact trend now there's no connection except that water, the fact that they have to do with the ocean. But certainly uh, the absence of pirates on the high seas has nothing to do with the temperature of the water and has much more to do with uh, technology and uh, the end of colonialism and a vast variety of other things. And in uh, evidence that researchers clearly have too much time on their hands, uh, one researcher that works in... Uh, big data uh, observed that there is a almost exact correlation between uh, states and their per capita of obese kids and um, Google searches for Purple Rain. So there you are. So whatever it is, stop searching for Purple Rain so our kids won't be obese. Now, of course, this is also the weakness of causal re arguments is that we could be too quick to connect a cause instead of a correlation. Um, if you've ever uh, read any Sherlock Holmes or what, this is what Sherlock Holmes is a master of this. Um, even though he constantly says that he is deducing things, he's not. He is inferring uh, and he's using inductive argument. And because uh, Sherlock Holmes has so much wisdom and so much learning and knowledge, he's so smart. He has a vast amount of experience, right? I think he argue, says that he sort of can tell by smell uh, hundreds and hundreds of different tobacco brands. And so, uh, you know, when he uh, finds a cigarette butt or smells somebody smoking uh, at the scene, he can, uh, he induces uh, 
from what he knows that what brand they must be using. And then he he goes on from there. So if you walked into uh, the restroom at a, at a restaurant, you're like, oh, I got to go to the restroom. And you walked in and there's a puddle on the floor and a sign on the toilet says it's out of order. You would probably infer, because it's a sign, that the toilet has overflowed and has caused that water on the floor. And you would probably be right. Um, the your experience in life and actually the sign there lead you to posit that the toilet has overflown. But also notice the window is open. Uh, so it is also possible that there was a thunderstorm, that there is a um, correlation between the water on the floor and the sign that the toilet is out of order, but maybe the water wasn't caused by the whatever's wrong with the toilet, right? Maybe the toilet actually doesn't have any water um, and the water came from somewhere else. So this is just the challenge that we have to sort of make sure that we have very strong causal evidence before we make too strong of an assertment of what caused the other. Now, uh, this brings us to uh, statistics, you know, and there's the famous quote, I think it's by Mark Twain, about uh, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Statistics are tricky, and in fact, there's an entire chapter in our textbook about the use of statistics and sort of being able to decide if a statistic is reliable based on the, what they're trying to infer from it. What often throws students is that we've said before that math is deductive. And so they're like, wait a minute, the statistics is math. Um, yes, that's true. But statistic is math that then is used to extrapolate about the future. Okay, And so that's the point at which it moves into an inductive argument. When you say uh, four out of five dentists survey recommend this toothpaste, there's an implied therefore you should use this toothpaste because you would get the benefit that these nine out of 10 dentists are um, seeing in their experience. Now where you see where we're in induction. So uh, statistics are used, you know, think about weather maps. I mean, they really, that is a complex series of predictive tools using statistics to say when these sort of, in, situations of humidity and temperature and wind and whatever, who knows what, all go into this equation and, th and it brings out a statistical probability that it will rain. And so the implied point is since we know all this and it will probably 90% chance it will rain tomorrow, then you should act on that information. So uh, statistics are making some sort of a predictive argument. So, you know, here we have an example that if, if I told you that 85% of the students at this high school are colorblind, and then Alan is a student at that school, therefore Alan is probably colorblind. So I am saying that there is a fact, 85% of the students in this school are colorblind. Now I am trying to then make a predictive jump that said if you choose a student at random, you have a very high probability that that student will be colorblind. Uh, and that's, I mean, 85%, that's pretty, pretty darn high. And so that seems like a pretty strong argument. Um, and of course, uh, you, our little penguin friend is saying, you know, not to worry about the fact that you're colorblind because it really doesn't matter up there in the old... Um, North Pole, uh, but that would be that would be the South Pole with penguins. Um, so, uh, just be aware of the fact that uh, statistics uh, are tricky, and that they are inductive, and they are by no means certain. Uh, you know, as long as there have been humans on the Earth, the sun has risen in the east every day, but that ultimately is a statistical uh, prediction that the sun will come up tomorrow. Uh, the earth could explode or um, maybe the sun will implode. Who knows? 
but I, I mean, I take the bet that the sun will come up tomorrow. But you need to understand that is based on an inductive argument of what has happened in the past will most likely happen in the future. And then another one that's kind of interesting and colorful are um, the use of arguments from analogy. You're saying that since this is like that, then the outcomes might be similar, or we can derive some uh, conclusion from the fact that they are similar. Um, the famous one, of course, Forrest Gump says, uh, life is like a box of chocolates. Uh, and then he says, you never know what you're going to get, right? So uh, life is like a box of chocolates. But I could also say life is like a box of chocolates because um, it, they are expensive and uh, only people who can afford them get a good one. Uh, you could say life is like a box of chocolates because uh, it's sweet. And so maybe you want to say that, you know, life is sweet. Um, so the thing about analogies is that they are only as strong as the similarities between your comparisons. Uh, so if you want to say that um, whenever uh, corruption uh, enters into a government system, it eventually collapses. And you say, well, for example, the U.S. government is increasingly corrupt and the ancient Greek uh, uh, government was corrupt and it eventually collapsed. Uh, and so the strength of that analogy is going to be how similar are they? Are their economic systems and their political systems alike enough that you could draw that analogy and it be strong and solid? Or are you really reaching because the only thing they share is a is corruption, but in many other ways they are not similar at all? And so uh, that's one of the things you always realize have to realize that when you're dealing with an analogy, you're drawing a, 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 to a Venn diagram and you're saying uh, this overlap is where they are similar. But you also have to always bear in mind that they are also dissimilar in a wide variety of ways. And you need to make sure that the uh, you're comparing apples to apples. And what you're trying to draw the conclusion is based on the strength of their similarities. All right, so that's your basic uh, guideline guidebook to inductive arguments. Uh, uh, notice I'm uh, holding a um, a map and a compass in my hands uh, that are uh, certainly the map is an inductive argument. It's a, a, a complicated sign, right? Um, and when you again have a map or a GPS, you're sort of assuming that the what you're looking at conforms to the reality of the situation based on your experience that maps are trustworthy. Uh, of course, uh, things could have changed since the map was built. Uh, you might not uh, have the correct map or it may you may misread the map, but it's basically an inductive argument that basically says that this is a basic representation of what it looks like and you can it's reliable that you can trust it. Now, the compass, on the other hand, is a something of a different matter. Um, it is a scientific fact that uh, the polar north uh, pulls a magnetic attraction of the compass needle, and that if you know that which way true north is, then you absolutely know uh, which way south is, east, west. You can deduce those from a known fact. Uh, in fact, you can use no all 360 uh, degrees of the compass once you have one fixed point. Um, now again, your the fundamental argument piece of that is that you assume that the Earth's poles haven't changed, that that is a reliable piece of data, and once you have that inductive piece nailed down, that this is true north, then the rest of it follows by deduction that says, okay, if this is north, then this must be north, south, east, and west.